I hope, um, I think many of you have the, the notes for tonight. It's just this scripture um, written on some. Um, if you don't have it, Pastor Michael could send that for you. Um, but if you do have it, wanna, what we do is that we're going to use that as a reference. Um, I will talk about stuff that's not on the notes, um, but you can take notes as well. Now, on the notes that he probably sent out to you, you have some questions there. It says page six and seven on those questions. And um, those questions are for you, in your personal time to, um, to spend time with the Holy Spirit, spend time with the word and to ponder on those scriptures, answer those questions. And then the Holy Spirit will give you further revelation and what is shared here tonight. So it's important that you, you, you know, answer those questions during the week. You know, pick a time when no one can bother you, take the phone off and, you know, just dive into the word and allow the Holy Spirit to give you revelation um, about these topics. Now, it's important that we understand that without revelation, without illumination, from the Holy Spirit, there's no way we can understand this word. There's no way we can understand the, the three parts of our being, the spirit, the soul, and the body. Now, a lot of Christians, um, they never dive into this because it's very, it's complex. You need Holy Spirit revelation to understand the division between the spirit, the soul, and the body. And the reason why a lot of Christians never um, get into it or understood it before is because they found it to be complex and hard and is left unattempted. But the Holy Spirit, um, there's a will of the Holy Spirit is that he takes us into this journey of dividing that which is of the flesh and that which is of the spirit, that which is of the soul and that which is of the spirit. And we find that in the word. We find that in Hebrews 4.12. Um, if you have your Bibles, or, or this, this scripture is not on the paper, but I'm just doing it as the Holy Spirit leads me. We will get, we'll dive into that secondly. But I want to read from Hebrews 4.12 first. He, no, most of you know that. For the word of God is quick and powerful, sharp and eight, two edges, so that divide spirit and soul and body. And I'm reading the original. I'm reading the King James Version. And the reason why I'm reading the King James Version, on my, on my phone, it has the, uh, the, the Greek, you know, for the, the King James. And we want to go over some words there. So it's really interesting to understand this. In Hebrews 4.12, the Bible said, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two edges sword. For the word of God is quick and powerful. The Bible also said the word of God is spirit. Um, the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two edges sword, piercing even to the dividing. I want you to pay attention to that word, piercing even to the dividing. The word divided in the Greek is called marismos. And I want you throughout this entire session to sort of remember that word, marismos. Marismos means to divide. Basically, it means to divide. Why I like marismos, uh, why is it Greek for divide? Is because it just reminds me of what the Holy Spirit is trying to do through his word. Now, the word of God, the word of God comes from the breath of God. The Holy Spirit spoke and the word of God is written. The Bible calls that the logos. The written word is called the logos. That's the, the Greek word for word as well. Now, when God speaks through his word to you and it speaks to your heart, we call that the rhema. R-H-E-M is called the rhema word. That's the illumination of the Holy Spirit. You see, the Holy Spirit cannot be separated from his word because the word of God came from the heart of the Father through the Holy Spirit, from the heart of the Father through the Holy Spirit. I always like to say Jesus is the face of God. Jesus said, if you see me, you see the Father, right? So that means Jesus is the face of God. You want to see the Father? Look at the face of Christ. Jesus is the face of God, but the Holy Spirit is the voice of God. Hmm. So Jesus is the face of God, right? But the Holy Spirit is a voice of God. The Holy Spirit breathed through man, breathed upon man, and they they wrote the word, and that word, the Bible said what? Jesus came, and that word has come from the Father. That word is Jesus. Jesus is the word. That word became flesh and dwelt among us. When that word is fleshed out, it becomes a rhema word. When that, God is, when that word is spoken, presence is, revealed, is re released, basically. 
the presence of God is here. The kingdom of God is here when that word is released, when that word is spoken. So it's one thing for the word to be written, but if the word is spoken, it brings change. It's powerful. That's the Holy Spirit speaking through you as an individual, not just a pastor, but speaking through you as an individual. When the Holy Spirit speaks the word, when you speak the word, it, be, it creates not only presence, the power of God backs up that word. You bring the jurisdiction of heaven on earth. The kingdom of God comes when you speak the word. That's why the devil would never want you to speak the word. He all wants you to shut you up. He wants you to believe a lie because the word is truth. When the devil tempted Jesus after 40 days in the wilderness, how did he fight him back? How did he, how did he return the insults? How did he fight the enemy? With the word. The word is a sword. So that's how we fight the enemy. The truth is what we use against the enemy. The truth of not only who we are, but who God is in us. So how do we fight the enemy? With the truth. With the word. The word is powerful. Use it. Amen. The word is powerful. Use the word against you. The word is the truth. The devil tell you that you're, you're, you're no good. You're depressed or you, you're incapable or, you know, nothing's going to work for you. you. You can speak the truth. So I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I'm the head and not the tail. Whatever I put my hands to do shall prosper. You know, I'm above and not beneath. You know, I am able to do all things. With God, all things are possible. There's nothing too hard for me because of Christ in me. You could tell the enemy those words and you speak those words and the word is powerful. But the only way you can do that is that the Holy Spirit leads you into his word. And that's where religion is different from relationship. Religion is man's attempt to please God. While relationship is intimacy with the Holy Spirit or rather walking as a co-laborer with God the same kind of relationship that Jesus had with the father is a relationship that we should have with the father through the Holy Spirit the same kind of relationship the disciple had with Jesus they live with him they stay with him they walk with him he told them what to do where to go what to eat it's the same kind of God Jesus showed us what was possible through the Holy Spirit and Jesus said, if I don't go, he can't come. So it's necessary that I can go so the Holy Spirit can come. Because when the Holy Spirit comes, he can make all that is mine and make it real to you, make it tangible, make it livable. So the intimate relationship with the Holy Spirit, I can't stress that more than anything else, is important to have. And how do you have that? You first, welcome him into your life. You welcome the Holy Spirit into your life. You say, Holy Spirit, come into my life, come into my heart. Now, the Holy Spirit lives in your spirit. I want to show you that. He lives in your spirit. But when it comes to your soul, you have to welcome it. I'll say it again. The Holy Spirit lives in your spirit. When you accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit came and made his home in you. He lives in you, in your spirit. And when that light came in your spirit, you became alive. God, life unto Christ. Something that Adam gave up. Now you be restored full to a greater Adam. So the Holy Spirit resides in you. And that Holy Spirit life flows from the inside out, from your spirit. But the only way the Holy Spirit can saturate your mind, can saturate your thinking, can influence your thoughts. The only way the Holy Spirit is allowed to influence your life, your thoughts, your ideas, your belief system, your soul, your will. The only way he can do that is if you allow him to. You have to allow the Holy Spirit to do it. You have to welcome it to do it. Because your soul belongs to you. And you are the gatekeeper of your soul. You are the gatekeeper of your mind. If you want the Holy Spirit help in order to handle life, you have to allow the Holy Spirit into your life by asking him to come in. And a lot of people have been Christians for a long time. You realize they haven't really ever really asked the Holy Spirit to come and flood my mind, flood my heart. And we call it the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Many of you probably have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, you may say, what is the baptism of the Holy Spirit? If the Holy Spirit lives in my spirit at salvation, then why do I need to be baptized? Right? 
you might say, what, what, what needs to be baptized? Does my spirit need to be baptized with the Holy Ghost? No, he already lives in me. His presence is in me. The Holy Spirit has sealed me on the day of redemption. I'm sealed. I have an incorruptible seed, the treasure in the earthen vessel, the mystery of the kingdom, Holy Spirit in me, Christ in us, the hope of glory. You have that. Now, what needs to get baptized? What needs to be immersed? It's your soul, your mind, your will, and your emotions. Your soul, which is your mind, your will, and your emotions. My mind needs the Holy Ghost. My mind needs to be flooded with the ideas of God. My mind needs to be renewed. And the word they use in the New Testament is renovated. My mind needs to be renovated to make new because I have ideas in here. I have to now replace those ideas with the word of God or the rhema word, which is the truth. Because my ideas can't save me. My ideas is not a proper reflection of reality. But God's word is my new reality when I accept him as Lord and Savior. Now, God's word dictates to us, but it's only done through the Holy Spirit being welcomed or allowed into your soul. And that flooding of your soul is what we call the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So a lot of people, when they receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, they jump, they run, they speak in tongues. So a lot of things happen, right? You see in the upper room what took place when they got baptized with the Holy Spirit. Tongues of fire came upon them. They were speaking in other tongues, right? So it was an event, something they had to wait for. Okay? Now in John chapter 20, Jesus breathed upon the, whole, the disciples and he told them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you have the time, read John chapter 20. Somewhere down there, you'll see Jesus breathed upon the disciples and they received the Holy Spirit. They saw the resurrected Christ. And that's the equivalent of salvation. We have the Holy Spirit in our spirit. But he's in our spirit. How do we get him out of there? How do we allow the Holy Spirit to manifest in this natural realm? You can only do so through your soul through your mind, your will, and your emotion. The only way he's allowed to manifest that is if we welcome him in, into our domain, which is our soul, so he can manifest in this domain the kingdom of God. And it's only done when we allow him to, when we welcome him to. So we say, Holy Spirit, flood my soul with your presence. And it's called the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And some people speak in tongues because what happens? All of a sudden your mind is made fruitless. All of a sudden, your, your tongue starts to tremble. All of a sudden, you pray in unknown languages because why? Your soul, your mind, you will, all of a sudden, you're conscious and aware of your spirit now for the first time. You see, your natural man cannot communicate with your spirit. It has to be done through another spirit. So the natural man cannot communicate with your spirit. It has to be done through another spirit. Well, some people do witchcraft. Some people do um, other types of, they use other evil spirit through which to connect with their own spirits. You know, this is a fallen spirit. It's not a spirit that is filled with the Holy Ghost because you can't have God and a devil living in one home, right? <laughs> your spirit house the presence of God. How can your spirit now have the devil there? So some people use, unsaved people would use demonic spirits to dive into the spirit realm to try to connect with spirits and try to get power, but it's demonic power they're trying to get to, but it's done through another spirit, an evil spirit. The Holy Spirit is the agent of the kingdom who takes everything that's in your spirit and makes it real to you, tangible, help you to think the thoughts and the ideas and the heart of the Father is known to you, and all of a sudden you can manifest it now in your life. And the Holy Spirit is responsible for taking that which is of God that which is of the spirit and making it known to you. So the Holy Spirit's the one that works with your soul, your mind, your will, and your emotions. He works with your mind to help you think the thoughts of Christ. He works with your mind to help you to come to terms with what's right and what's wrong. He works with your mind so that you could have the mind of the Father, the renewed mind of God, so you can see things right. You can perceive things right. Would you say maybe 80 to 90% of your problems comes from a wrong perception of the way things are, right? So you could have the same event happen to the two different people and they see two different things altogether. And it causes chaos. Because why? The Holy Spirit ought to, 
if we allow him, help us to see things right side up, not upside down, see things the right way. So we need the Holy Spirit to work with our soul and we need to be surrendered to him and we need to ask him to come and lead us, and direct us always so we could be on the right path. But not only that, we can see God for who he really is and then we can see ourselves for who we really are. So a relationship with the Holy Spirit is necessary just to understand what we're about to get into. Amen? The Bible said in Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is quick and powerful. Well, I'm going to go a little quicker now because we want to cover some ground here and at least finish the, this lesson. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing the sunder of soul and spirit. Now, why does the word of God want to divide soul and spirit? We'll answer that in a second. And of the joints and the marrow. Joints and marrow is a physical. So the word of God is given to us. Why? The word of God is given to us so that we can divide. It's called marismos. We can put a separation between the spirit and the soul. The word of God is given so that we can know that which is of the spirit and we can know that which is of the flesh. That which is of God and that which is of man or that which is of the devil or that which is of the world. You get what I'm saying? And the two can never be in sync unless one, desi one desires or one surrenders to the other. The natural man could never please God. Remember what the Bible said in Romans, right? They can never. So the word of God is given to us because it's like a, not only powerful tool against the enemy, a sword, but it divides. It divides the spirit and the soul and the body, the marrow and the joints. And it's a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. So we see here now, maybe for the first time you see it this way. Yeah, the word of God is quick and powerful. You can use it against the enemy, but it does something more. It divides that which is of the spirit and that which is of the soul. So you might say, to what consequence is there if we fail to use the word to divide the soul and the spirit? It's a huge consequence. Number one, we will confuse a lot of time natural things for spiritual things. And that's the number one tool the enemy uses to confuse the saints of God. A lot of people started off hot and heavy in the Lord. The Holy Spirit is speaking to them. They're running with the Lord. And just because they fail to discern that which is of the spirit and that which is of the flesh, and they haven't allowed that word to really divide the spirit from the soul, all of a sudden you realize they followed deceiving spirits that led them somewhere else until they get to a place and they look back and they say, wow, how did I get all the way here? Because why? They were chasing something else. You have to allow the word of God to just divide the spirit and the soul. So because the word of God is given for that, we want to see now how does this work? I'm going to dive deeper into this. So let's grab your notes real quick. Um, the first part there is that um, number one on the first page, which is page number four in your notes, we have three part being spirit, soul, and body. Now, Maybe you have a pen, you can write on your piece of paper here. It's important to understand this. When you're referring to your spirit and your soul and your body, it's three parts, yes. So we have three parts. Now, we say three parts because it's, it's categorized in three parts. So this is not on the notes right now, but I'll, you can write this down if you want to. You can remember it. We'll refer to it many times, so you don't have to write it too as well. The spirit is a seat of your conscience. So in your spirit, think of the spirit as a house, okay? Your spiritual house. Now let's go back to the Old Testament. We get the same idea in the temple. Remember the temple had three parts? Moses' temple. You had the Holy of Holies, where the Ark of the Covenant was. Then you had the inner court, where you had the table of shoe bread. You had the candlesticks, the candle stand. And then you had the, 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 the fragrance, the table of fragrance there, the incense burning there in the, the inner court. Then you have the outer court. So the three parts of the temple is illustration of the three parts to our being. The, the most sacred, the innermost part, the part that God created for himself is your spirit, 
Think of it at the inner court where the Ark of the Covenant is. Now, what was in the Ark of the Covenant? It was the tablet of stone, the commandments, right? Aaron's rod, that, that bud, and he had manners in there too as well, <clears throat> I think. So if you think of your spirit as the innermost part, noblest part, some people say your spirit is like in, on your belly, because the Bible said out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. Now, you, what I'm saying, belly, is that your spirit doesn't determine you know, what food you eat. But it's, it's, if you were to think of location, it's here. So think of your mind is here, but your spirit, you can't see my belly, but it's here, okay? So when people say think from your gut, Okay, that means your spirit's involved in that thinking. Now, the way it's supposed to be, the way it ought to be as Christians, that we ought to live from our spirit through our mind, will, and emotion into this world. So not our mind do the thinking for us so much, but we think it with them. The Bible called the mind of the spirit knows the will of God, and you intuitively find that out, which is of the spirit, and your conscience, which is off your spirit, will now bear the will of God on your mind. And your mind will now receive the will of God through your conscience, which is off your spirit. And your mind belongs to your soul. And as soon as your mind receives instructions and truth, your mind now will send those signals to what? Your brain, your natural mind. So you got three minds in you. You got a spiritual mind, right? You get a natural mind, we call it the soul. And then you get a physical mind, we call it the brain. <laughs> that might get confusing for you, but we'll refer to that later on. So we live from our spirit. The Holy Spirit lives in our spirit. So your spirit house the very presence of God. In the Old Testament, the priest, should he go into the Holy of Holies, he'll be the only one there because the presence of God will come there. He will converse with God in the Holy of Holies. Because that's where the presence dwells. The ark dwells. The word of God, which was the, the tablet of stone, was in the ark, in the holy of holies. It's a indicative and it's a, it, 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 it show, illustrates where's the word now. The word of God is in our spirit. Isn't that right? Right? Do you need, and this is a question I'll toss out there to you, just so you understand what your spirit is. Do you need any more word in your spirit? Or do you have the total word in your spirit? Do you need to be added to in your spirit or you have it all already in your spirit? Yes or no? Who can answer that? Okay. No one can answer? <laughs> Somebody said, Naz said yes. We have, no, as yes means we have everything in our spirit or we need to be added to Okay, I'll answer it. Amen. We have everything. Naz said, um, because we have the Holy Spirit, well, it, we have everything. Hanif said, Hanifa said, and Naz said, we have everything. That's right. Your spirit has everything that you possibly need for life. That means this physical life you have and godliness. Everything you need to worship and honor God, you have already in your spirit. Everything you need to do what you're a call to do, what you're assigned to do, what is your purpose here on earth, you have already in your spirit. It's there. There's nothing more that you need that you don't have already. Maybe you could say that with Say there's nothing more. I'm not hearing you. <laughs> you don't have to put your mic on. There's nothing more that you need that you don't already have that you haven't received through salvation. When Jesus came to live in you, he brought everything in you. He brought all of heaven in you. You have all of heavenly, all of heaven's resources available to you in your spirit. The problem is, I need those resources now in this natural world. I need those resources in my body, right? I need that healing that's in my spirit, that's in heaven, where there's no sickness, there's no disease, only love, joy, and peace. I need that. In my, I need my body to, I need my body to, to manifest that. Not only that, I need my mind to manifest that because sometimes you might sow a thought in my mind and maybe your mind or your will is not powerful enough to override that thought. All of a sudden you end up doing something or thinking something that's completely opposite to what God thinks concerning you, right? That means our mind needs it to manifest. And the only way our minds 
will manifest the fullness that's in us already. Meaning there's nothing more that you need. It's all here. The only way our mind can manifest that is if you allow the Holy Spirit to make it real to you. And if you cause your mind to surrender to the will of God or the will of his word, his word. The mind, your mind needs the word. Why do we have the Bible? No, this is not a question. Why do we have the Bible if your spirit already has the word? Why do we have the Bible if your spirit has the word living in it? Who can tell me? Why do we need the word? Why did God go through such great lengths to preserve this word that we have today? That's a miracle. Do you know your Bible is a miracle? That it lasts this long and it stayed the way it stayed pure. Many men tried to defile it, destroy it, but they're never successful because the Holy Spirit breathed those words into existence because it was necessary. We realize the word is necessary, but why do we have the word if our spirit already has the fullness of the word dwelling in it? Some people say to share it with others. Some people say to remind us of what we, we have. Those are good. But more than that, we need the word, okay, listen to this. We need the word to condition our minds. Let's see what can I relax. We need the word to condition mm -hmm. our minds, okay, to condition our minds to accommodate who we are in our spirit. So mm -hmm. when you read the word, it helps mm -hmm. yeah, so you that, you right that your spirit already knows. What did Baba say? Be still and know. That script you was given to your spirit, right? Be still here and know in your spirit. So every time you read the word, think of this way. Your word of God, the Bible said, is spirit, okay? The word of God is spirit and life. God is a spirit. So when God speaks, what does he speak? Spirit, right? And spirit ministers to what? Spirit. Isn't that right? When you accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, your spirit became alive unto God. The same way Jesus' spirit was alive unto the Father, so is your spirit alive unto God. It's the same spirit that lives, the same resurrection spirit. That same resurrection spirit is in you. So your spirit is alive. Your spirit knows the will of God. So when you say you have all of God in you, you know the will of God. You know his plans. You know his purposes. It's all here. The mind now, in order for your mind to know the will of God, it has to read the word because the word will tell your natural mind how the spirit thinks. What's the reality of that spirit life? That's why the word is spirit. The word is spirit, and your mind cannot know the spirit unless it first what? receives that word that's why the word of god separate that which is of spirit that which is of the flesh but only that the spirit and we'll read a scripture that said the spirit is like the mirror that the word of god is like a mirror when you look at the word you see who you really are which is your spirit being so we can safely say this i am a spirit i have a soul and i live in a body I am a spirit being. My spirit is complete. I'm alive in Christ. I'm seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. All things are possible in my spirit. My spirit is perfect. My spirit cannot be defiled because it has a what? It has a seed that cannot be defiled. Okay? My spirit is sealed until the day of redemption. Once you accept Christ and it's legitimate, he comes and lives in you. You're sealed. There's nothing more that you can do to make yourself any more saved than you are right now. You know that? There's nothing you can do to make yourself any more saved than you are right now. Some people think they have to own, they have to earn their way to salvation. No, you are full and complete and there's nothing more that needs to be added to you. It's in your spirit. But that which is in my spirit, I need it now to flood my mind, to help me to think the right thoughts to flood my emotions so I can feel the right things and to flood my will so that what? I can make the right decisions. My mind, my will, my
my emotions, my soul. That's your mind, your will, and your emotions. Three parts to your soul, your mind, your will, your emotion. When you accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, your mind, your will, and emotion, your soul, guess what? Was your soul saved? Yes or no? Who received salvation? Anybody knows? Was your mind, was your soul saved when you accept Jesus Christ? That's a mind-boggling one, right? Was my soul saved? I know my spirit was saved because he came to live in my spirit, so he cannot be saved, right? But was my mind saved? Was my soul saved? My mind, my will, and emotion. Was my soul saved? Yes or no? You can tell me. Come on, at least one of you. Put a note in there. Yes, somebody said. Okay. Well, I'm sad to say no. <laughs> your mind is being, your soul is being saved. That's what the Bible said, to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Work out means it's already done on the inside. Your spirit is saved. My soul, my mind, my will, and emotion now has to what? Has to be sanctified. And what is sanctification? It's a process of being saved through renovation, the Bible calls it, or renewing our mind. Renewing our mind. What are we renewing our mind with? We're trying to replace any thought that doesn't line up with God's will and his word with his thoughts and his word. That make sense? We're trying to now replace any thought or ideas, okay, that doesn't line up with his will and his word, with now his will, his thoughts, and his words. And that's how our mind is renewed daily, and that's how the spirit is now able to flow through us, because your mind must be in a place where, it, where it's able to accommodate and surrender the will of God. Your mind must work in sync with the Holy Spirit if you should know the thoughts of God. And I'll give you a, a scripture in a minute that will explain that as well. So your soul is being saved. Now, I'll get another question for you. Um, and we can explain that later on too. Jesus, it took Jesus 30-something years, okay, for his soul, his mind, his will, and emotion to accommodate who he was in his spirit, which was God. Why did Jesus have to go fast and pray? Why did Jesus have to suffer? Because his soul, his mind, his will and emotion had to come to terms, had to be in sync with the spirit to the point where he was mindful even when the virtue left his body to heal the woman with the issue of blood. Remember that? We spoke about it last week. He was mindful of that because why? His mind was in sync with his spirit. So what ought to happen here now? We have to get to the point where our mind, our very mind is in sync, in sync with the spirit, just like Jesus. Now, that's a high order, right? But Jesus didn't come to show us some standard that is totally unachievable to like say, hey, I can do it, but you can't. No, not at all. He's not like that. Jesus came to show us what could be done should we trust the father the same way he did. Jesus came to set a standard so that we can achieve that, so that's achievable. Not only that, he said, greater works you would do because I'm going to send my Holy Spirit. And my Holy Spirit will come in you and do it through you. And I'm going to be with my Father. So we get double whammy. I'm making intercession. Whatever you ask in my name here, my Father will do it, right? I'm giving you my name, my authority. And I'm going to be with my Father. I'm going to be praying that whatever you ask in my name, I'll be right to my Father. So let's do it. Let's do it. And I'm giving you my Holy Spirit to actually do it. So double whammy, that's what he said, greater works will you do? Because it's possible now, because we have the Holy Spirit. But we knew this stuff, but it, we couldn't quite put it together to the point where we could be like Christ. I'm telling you tonight, and I submit to you, we can be just like Jesus while we walk on this earth. And we could even do greater works just because we have the Holy Spirit. And we have Jesus himself in making the session for us on our behalf before the Father. Isn't that wonderful? Greater is he that's for us than he that's against us. Amen. So there's nothing too hard for you to do. There's nothing that's impossible to you because we have the Holy Spirit and we have Jesus. So the fullness of God is in our spirit. When we accept Christ, our spirit was saved. Okay. We saved from death. 
we, we did surely die when we partake of that fruit. Now we are alive. Okay. God came and made his home in us. And because he lives in us, now all of a sudden now there's life, there's peace, there's joy in our spirit. My mind, even though I have joy in my spirit, sometimes I don't have joy. Sometimes I don't have peace. Why? Because the mind is being renewed daily, daily. So for the Christian life, next year shouldn't meet you with the same problems you have this year. Because why? Every day your mind is taken on a new identity, which is the mind of Christ. Amen? We now have the mind of Christ. Your mind should not be the same. If your mind is thinking the same thoughts this year as last year, if you haven't grown in the way you perceive reality to reflect God's reality through you, not the way you see things based on your conditioning or twisted belief system or people's ideas that you, you bring into your life and then you see things through that or the way the world wants you to see things or the way the devil wants you to see things or the way your family wants you to see things, right? Right? or the way an ungodly friend wants you to see things, or the way even a Christian friend who has distorted views wants you to see things. No, we have to get away from all that. And we have to now what? Allow our minds to see things the way God wants us to see through our spirit as the Holy Spirit bears the will of God through our conscience on our mind. The Holy Spirit works with your conscience. And as he works with your conscience, you would hear the will of God. So I'm saving my spirit, my soul, my mind, my will, and emotion is being saved daily because I got to get this in sync. I got to know the will of God. I got to grow in the will of God. I got to grow in seeing things right, right? Every day. And your flesh is never going to be saved. It will stay here, but it's going to, the corruptible is going to put on incorruptible. It's only going to be saved. Your flesh, your body is only going to be saved when you see Jesus face to face. That makes sense? Right? So my spirit is saved. My mind is being saved every day, daily, daily, picking up my cross. Now, if I have the fullness of God in me, why do I need to pick up my cross every day and follow him? Why do I need to die to self? Because dying to self basically means replacing your thoughts, ideas, the enemy's ideas, everybody's ideas with the ideas and thoughts of the Father. And whatever competes in your mind, take every thought captive to what? The will of God, right? Anything that exalts itself above the knowledge of Christ, right? What do you do? Take it captive. You cast it down. You destroy it. So every day you have to now allow this mind, the soul. You're in charge of your soul. Your soul belongs to you. You have jurisdiction of your soul. The enemy can't encroach on your jurisdiction. Same way God or angels cannot encroach on your jurisdiction. You have given, you accepted him as Lord. He came into your spirit. You already given rights to your spirit. He came in there. He took, he made a resident in there and that's it. Now, as you depend on him, as you meditate on the word day and night, then you begin to take on your new identity, which is your spirit identity. That's when the enemy begins to fear you. When the enemy looks at you, he sees in a spirit, he sees in a psyche realm. Do you have on you something that the enemy is afraid of? Do you have on you something that's a threat to the enemy? If you're not a threat to the enemy, the enemy will never come after you. You know that? So... You might say, well, the second you become a threat to him, all of a sudden I'm receiving all those attacks. Well, every attack is an opportunity to show the authority and the power of God. Because what? The kingdom of God is power. It's not words. It's not even this Bible study. The kingdom of God is power. And it's in demonstration. Just read Corinthians. Paul spoke over and over and over to the Corinthians church and told them, I didn't come with you with persuasive words or in man's wisdom, but I came with you with power and demonstration, demonstration of the spirit. The kingdom of God is power. So every sickness, every circumstance, every tragedy is an opportunity, is an opportunity to demonstrate the power of God that resides in your spirit as your mind agrees with your position, as your mind agrees with who you are, you are now able to demonstrate the spirit. You can pray for the sick and they shall recover in Jesus' name. But your mind is the one that needs to be renewed. Your mind is the one that either hinders 
or allow the spirit of God to manifest in this natural world, in your natural realm. And that's your soul. So we can say this way, my spirit is saved. My soul is being saved. My flesh or my body will only be saved when we see him face to face. I'll say it again. My spirit is saved, is sealed until the day of redemption. We're going to go through a lot of scriptures that shows you this later on. My spirit is saved. My soul, which is my mind, my will, and emotion, is being saved daily, 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 daily. And my body will only be saved when we see him face to face. And that's salvation. Isn't that interesting? That's salvation. So a lot of times the enemy will come to you. And I, I do a lot of counseling people who face a lot of difficulties every day. They call me all the time. Every day I get people crying. Today I had three people crying in, in difficult, severe, severe circumstances and situations every day. And the number one trick of the enemy on these people is to make them doubt themselves as to who they are. Is to make them doubt themselves as to who they are. That's the number one trick of the enemy, to make you doubt who you are, to underestimate your ability. The enemy always likes to help make you underestimate your ability. You are just like Christ on this earth. And I want you to know that in your heart and mind more than anything else, especially through the study, to realize that I am just like Christ. I have the very same resurrection spirit that was in Christ Jesus now resides in me and his blood flowed through my veins. He's wrapped up in my spirit, but guess what? I'm learning how to unlock. I'm learning how to release the spirit through my mind, my will and emotion, so I can know the thoughts of God. I can intuitively discern the will of the Father and execute it here in this realm that causes and releases an open heaven over my situation, makes all things that are impossible, possible now. In Jesus' name. And you have that in you. So don't let the enemy make you doubt who you are. What you read in that word is exactly who you are in your spirit. You don't need nothing else. When Jesus was on that cross and he said it is finished, that means you don't need anything else. Do you know that? A lot of times we pray and say, Lord, help me and do this and do that, do the other, and I need this. Jesus, more than 2,000 years ago, said it is finished. It means everything. Everything has been wrapped up in himself. And when we accept him, we get the whole package. I'll say it again. Everything has been wrapped up in, in himself. And when we accept him as Lord and Savior, we get the entire package. We get all the resources of heaven. We get God himself who created the universe and all the planets and the stars and things known and unknown to man. He created all of it. Now lives in me. He's not resident in my spirit. And he's saying, now I am capable because he gave me his Holy Spirit to make me capable of doing what he did and greater works. Isn't that amazing? And each and every one of us have that ability. So from now on, don't doubt who you are. I'm exactly like Christ and I refuse to be anybody else. Lord, help me to be the Christ-like version of myself. Let's pray that. Say this after me. Say, Lord, I'll say it again. Say, Lord, help me to be the Christ-like version of myself. Let's say it again. Say, Lord, help me to be the Christ-like version of myself. Say it one more time. Say, Lord, help me. And say it like you really mean it. Say, Lord, help me to be the Christ-like version of myself and help me to rid myself of this false version of my life. Help me to rid myself of this false person I've become because I try to live my life independent of my spirit, not in sync with my spirit. And let this be the prayer today for your heart and your mind. So again, my spirit is saved the second I accept Christ, the Lord is saved. My soul, my mind, my will, and emotion is being saved. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Renew your mind. Meditate on the word day and night. Okay? And you would change. Your body now will only be saved 
when you see him face to face. So your body ought to always be a slave. So the order that God laid out for us, again, is spirit, soul, and body. Your spirit is the most noblest part, is the inner court. Your soul is the outer court. And your body, no, your body, your soul is the, the inner court. You have the holy of holy spirit, inner court, soul, the outer court is akin to the body. Um, everybody could see the outer court. They had to go into the inner court. The same way I can't see your soul, the same way back in the day, they couldn't see the inner court unless they go through the curtain into the inner court. And when they go into the inner court, they couldn't see in the holy of holies unless they go through the veil. Remember that veil? Only the priest can go through that veil. Remember that veil that split in two when Jesus died on the cross from top to bottom? Man couldn't go into that veil. You couldn't go into the Holy of Holies unless you entered through that veil. And the only way you can live the second you go into that Holy of Holies is if you are righteous and holy. It's a key unto salvation. It's the same thing that happens today. Our spirit is saved. You're holy. You are righteous. You are perfect. It's hard to say, right, that I'm holy. He just did something wrong. He did, just did something unholy. Or he just had an unholy thought. Imagine how many times during the day we have unholy thoughts, right? A lot. So, but imagine if you would enter into the holy of holies, you would die. God set it up in such a way that he became death for us so that we would no longer die. So now we have mercy and grace that we can call upon and we can, his spirit can live in us, in our spirit, sealed off onto the day of redemption. Because you can't do anything to defile that spirit. You can't do anything to defile. Once it happens, it's once and for all. He lives in your spirit. It's my mind that suffers. Because I grew up with trauma. Or I grew up with the ideas of man. I grew up with the ideas of my parents. I grew up with the ideas of society. I grew up with the ideas of peers and friends and people and my work and my job. And all these ideas have permeated in my mind. Now I go to church and all of a sudden it's a hard thing now for me to know the word, understand the word, because every day we ought to replace the ideas and expectation and belief system of the world with the belief, expectation, and the thoughts of the Father. The Bible said that God's thoughts concerning you is as numerous as the sand on the seashore. Imagine that. How many sand, grains of sand is on the seashore? Billions, millions, I'm not sure how many. Imagine his thoughts concerning you, his thoughts, his ideas concerning you is as numerous as the grain of sand on the seashore. Isn't that crazy? Isn't that just amazing? So guess what? What's the challenge now? The challenge is my mind needs to know these thoughts. <laughs> my mind needs to know these thoughts. And the only way your mind can know these thoughts is if you meditate on his word, because his word is his thoughts concerning you. And his word is a reflection of what's in your spirit. Put it this way. You know, if you want to see a movie, uh, the, the theater or the cinema, you go there, there's a projector and it projects on a screen, right? So think of the spirit as that projector. So all the programming is in that projector, the slide is in that projector, whatever is in there, the digital projectors now. So it comes in a little uh, SIM card and just stick it in the projector. So think of that projector, the spirit. That whole, every, that whole movie is on a small SIM card, a digital movie, okay? Think of your spirit. It has everything of God. The whole movie is there. But any way that you can see what that movie is, it has to be projected on a screen. So your spirit projects on that screen. Let's say that screen is your mind, okay? That screen is your mind. So the projection, that light, is not tangible, but you can see it, yes. So that, as the spirit of God projects his will, Okay, the only way you can see what's on that screen is if you have the word that conditions that screen to make the word noticeable. So the word of God creates a screen, creates the right atmosphere, 
creates the white background, the smooth surface on that screen. The word of God does that over time so that you can see clearly who you are and who he is in your spirit. Why is the word of God necessary? That's the only way you're going to know who you are. Why is the word of God necessary? It's the only way you could discern what's of God and what's of the flesh. Why is of consequence that we should know what's of God and what's of the flesh? Is because, number one, the enemy can get a foothold because he can deceive you should you follow the flesh. Number two, you can walk away not knowing who you are. And if you don't know who you are, the devil will have a heyday with you. If you're not reminded of who you are, the devil will mess you up. He'll give you every other version of yourself. Jesus didn't fell for that. Jesus knew who he was. That's why when the devil said, if you're the son of God, then you will turn these stones into bread. Jesus knew who he was. So he didn't have to turn any stone into any bread. Okay? He didn't have to prove to anyone. If you know who you are, you don't have to prove yourself to anyone. Jesus saw the trickery. If Jesus fell for that, he would have, God knows. Maybe he never got to the cross and there's no hope for man. Because in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit didn't dwell in the spirit of believers. He came upon them to do works of men. Why did Jesus have to come? Because his idea was to be at home in man. And only Jesus Christ could die the kind of death that allowed God to give us the free gift of his son and that was Holy Spirit that lives in us. So we needed a man God or a God man to die the kind of death, to be perfect, to pay the price for the privilege of having his presence. The privilege of having his presence. Do you know it's a privilege to be a Christian? Somebody paid a price for you to be dwelled in, to have the, your spirit alive, to have your spirit sealed. Do you know it's a privilege and an honor to have a spirit that's redeemed because somebody paid a price for it? Well, if we don't pay a price for it, it's not that valuable to us. But I pray tonight you're reminded of the price that was paid so you could have a spirit that has possibilities. If you suffer in your mind, Tonight, you have every possibility now to have the mind of Christ and you can have a normal mind again. If you suffer in your emotions, you have every possibility through the Holy Spirit and because of the perfection in your spirit for your emotions to be in sync with your spirit so you can feel what is right and not feel what is wrong. You get what I'm saying? If you suffer in making the right decisions, the Bible said, I think it's in, Philippians 2.13 is God who works in us both to will and to do according to his good pleasure. For it's God that works in us both to will and to do according to his good pleasure. The Holy Spirit works in us, giving us the power to make the right decisions and the power to execute the right actions. The Holy Spirit does it. The Holy Spirit infuses your being so that you can handle the stresses of life. And we have that ability through his indwelling. Now, I know we didn't hit a lot of scriptures in here. Let me hit a couple and then we'll end, okay? Where's Bishop? Pastor Michael is on here. I don't see him. One second. Okay. Probably got cut off again. Oh, there you are. Have a couple more minutes again, Pastor? Bro. Yes, take a few minutes, yes. All right, just so it gets up. So we have three parts, spirit, soul, and body. Is it of any consequence that we have to divide that? Yes, we're forced to divide it because the word of God is spirit, and it wants to keep all things of spirit off the spirit. Now, the spirit is three parts. We say it's where you communicate with God. Okay, the house, the presence of God. Your spirit is a house. It's where you communicate. Your spirit is a seat or the home of your conscience. And we'll talk more about conscience later on, the role of your conscience. And your spirit is also the home of your intuition. Conscience basically means to have spontaneous judgment apart from natural influence so your spirit will help your conscience to know what is right and wrong your conscience judges 
and your conscience will say yes. Your conscience, you know, you're doing something wrong, and all of a sudden, and in your spirit is saying, That's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong. Who do you think is talking there? The devil? No. <laughs> it's your conscience in sync with the Holy Spirit, right? It's saying, Hey, it's wrong. No, you're doing it, but it's at the same time you're doing it, all of a sudden something is saying it's wrong, it's wrong, but you still go against the voice of conscience. The Holy Spirit works with your conscience so you know what's right and wrong to discern. Intuition is to have spontaneous wisdom. Spontaneous wisdom comes from nowhere. It comes from the Holy Spirit. We know that. It comes from God. It comes from your spirit because the spirit knows all things, right? Intuition is that you have spontaneous wisdom devoid of any external influence. So this wisdom didn't come from man. This wisdom didn't come from what you learn on YouTube or what you just read. This wisdom came spontaneously that roused in your spirit and you knew exactly what the solution was. Intuition. That's of your spirit. So we know the will of God because we intuitively discern the will of God. And our conscience now bears the will of God in our minds, and our minds tell our body what to do. That's how it works. So all of this inner working takes place from our spirit through our soul in our bodies. So we can safely say now that my spirit is the master. He determines what to do. Okay, now if you go back in the old days where there were slaves, the master will tell the servant what to do, and the servant will tell the slave, will make the slave rather do it. So the master has the plan, the master knows what to do, which is your spirit. The master tells the servant what to do, and the servant serves, serve. So let's call it the posture of our soul. What is the posture of our Christian life? What is our posture as human beings on this earth in sync with the Lord? We serve. The servant surrenders his will to the master's will. The servant can't do what he wants. He has to do what the master wants. Surrender. Serve, right? Yield. In sync. So the servant always wants to be in sync with the master, not independent of the master. When Eve partake of that fruit, all of a sudden she was independent of the master. Before Eve partake of that fruit, exactly what she saw is what her spirit saw. The second she partake of that fruit, all of a sudden, her mind was independent of our spirit. Now we're back in sync. Now we have to allow. These are words that you have to remember. Allow. Surrender. Yield. Give in. Okay? These are all solical terms for the way we relate to our spirit. I'll say it one more time. They're all solical terms, solical, S-O-U-L-I-C-A-L, solical terms that relates to the way we relate to our spirit. So your spirit is a master, my soul is a servant, and the servant will make the slave do what the master wants. So we say the slave is our body. Your body is a slave. Your body ought to never be master. When your body is a master, it tells you what to do. It's called hedonism. Okay? It's called following your baser instincts. A lot of people walk around with an animalistic, hedonistic, psychopathic instinct. That's the body as the master. That person is way gone, way off course. Your body ought to never, your body ought to always be a slave. Don't let your body tell you what to do. You tell your body what to do. Always remember that. So your body is a slave. My soul is a servant, always yielded, always surrendered to who? The mind of the spirit. You have a mind in your spirit. I need to know what that mind is thinking. I need to know what the thoughts of God is. And the only way I can do that is through meditation on the word, the word, the word, prayer, the word. Go to church, go to church, go to church, go to church. Why do you have to go to church? Because you'll be bombarded with the spirit word rather than bombarded with everything else on the outside that feeds the baser instinct in the flesh and feed the independence in the mind. That makes sense, right? Why do I go to church? Because we need spirit. We need spirit in our mind. When you go to church, it forces your mind to be aware of the spirit. And when you hear the word, it allows you to know what the spirit thinks, what the spirit feels, so that what? So you can be more from your spirit rather than live from the flesh. That's why we need church. That's why we need to be in the church every time the door 
influence, be there because I need, I want to be like Christ. I need this mind to be renewed. And the only way I can allow this mind, the only way this mind can be renewed is if I bombard, bombard this mind with the truth. I need the word. I need the word. I need prayer. I need to be in sync. What does that happen? Church allows the atmosphere for that to take place. Now you should have your church in your little house too as well. Your little prayer closet, wherever you spend that time with the Lord. But when you go in church, something happens when you go to church. I'll end with this. Or we'll continue. We'll continue lesson one next week a little bit. And then we'll go into lesson two and finish that. I'll talk less and delve more into that. When you go into church, the Bible said, if two or three are gathered, he comes in the midst. You know what happens? When each of you show up at church, each of you carry the Holy Spirit. You bring the Holy Spirit with you. He's there. But something happens. When two or three are gathered, all of a sudden he comes. The manifest presence. He comes in the midst. The manifest presence. This is not his indwelling presence. His indwelling presence dwells in you. He stays in you. He's not going anywhere. He never leave you or forsake you. Okay? He's there with you till the end. But then there's a manifest presence. What is a manifest presence? The manifest presence comes when there's two or three gathered. So there are two or three gathered in his name. The manifest presence comes to get things done. You need breakthrough? Show up at church. You need a little more umph. You need something more to happen. You need the anointed to break the yoke. What is the anointed? The manifest presence of God. When you go to church, you encounter the anointing where anything is possible. And you receive breakthrough in Jesus' name. So church is important. And be in church. Stay in church. Go to church. Because it does more for who you are than you could ever think possible. Um, all right. Any comments? Uh, I know we spoke about a lot tonight. It's a little heavier, but it's going to get heavier and heavier and heavier. But I'll give you the notes. And I think this is recorded too as well. So it's good to play it back. Okay, so B. Any comments? Uncle Michael, anybody else? Any questions before we go, before we pray? Anything that needs to be clarified? Because I want to give you about five, 10 minutes question. If you are confused about something, if something I said that I didn't finish the thought, that happens a lot, uh, you can ask and we can get into that. Okay, we have a quiet bunch tonight. <laughs> All right. Well, I guess we could pray then. Uncle Michael, what do you think? That's right. All right. Well, do you know, even before I pray, we can use the same teaching to help us with sickness in our bodies. The Bible said, the Spirit of God that's in you will quicken even your mortal body. The spirit of God that's in you would even quicken your mortal body. Can the Holy Spirit quicken a, a body that's sick or it's, it's, it's malfunctioning? I'm sure he could, but does he desire that we be healed? Yes, because by his stripes, we were healed. He took the stripes on his back so we healed, that we receive healing. He desires us to be healed. So first thing first, we have to fix our theology. God desires that we are healed. He desires that you, or some people say, well, God allowed a sickness. You can say what you want, but the fact that he took those beaten on his back, okay, means that he desires that we are healed. And God takes no pleasure in his saints being in pain. God takes no pleasure in his saints being sick. Do you know that? And if you're not convinced of that, how can you trust him as a good father? If you think that God takes pleasure, if God makes someone sick, then how can he trust him as a good father? Would a good father put sickness on his, on his son? Even if he did a bad thing, you think he would want to inflict him so he suffers? No, not at all. If you wouldn't even do that to your own kids, right? How much more would a loving father who loves trillion times the way you can love? Why would he then put sickness on you? Why would he allow sickness? We live in a fallen world. Where if we do get sick, it's an opportunity. Because Bible said he will cause all things, right? Turn all things around for good. Sickness is an opportunity to show the power of God. It's an opportunity, all right, to sense 
the salvation of the Lord, salvation of my body so that I can get healed. So you should never stop trusting God for healing. 100% healing, regardless of whatever it is. Never stop God. Never stop trusting God for healing because it's his desire. God don't want you sick. He takes no pleasure in you being painful. God is not trying to make you sick so that he can teach you some lesson. No, God did that with Jesus so that you wouldn't have to learn any more lessons. Jesus took it all. Jesus, God made Jesus sick so you should not be sick. Isn't that right? That's the word. That's a theoretical word. That's the position in your spirit. Now, how can I allow this word to manifest in my flesh? We have to release it. Say, Lord, I welcome who I am, who you are in my spirit. Lord, I welcome who I am and who you are in my spirit. And I'll be released through my soul into my flesh. Quicken my mortal body with your healing virtue now in Jesus' name. Let's say that. Say, Lord, I release who you are and who I am in my spirit to flow through my soul into my body. In Jesus' name. Jesus all right, I want to pray for you now. Father, in Jesus' name, we come against every hindrance to healing tonight. We invite your holy presence. We invite you, Lord Father. You said, oh, Lord, you always honor your word with demonstration of the Spirit's power. And Father, your word was sent out, and it was good. And we ate, and we are well fed. And it was sweet to our minds, and our hearts, and our mouths, and our tummies. Now we say, oh, Lord, honor your word with signs and wonders. And in Jesus' name right now, based on the authority you have given us, Based on the salvation and the completeness of the cross, where you saved us, healed us, and delivered us, oh Lord, through that one act of obedience on that cross. In Jesus' name right now, I command every body that is inflicted with disease or sickness, what it be, because of what they did or who did it to them, whatever the reason is, oh Lord, Father, we say your cross, bypass it all. In Jesus' name, and we say they have received forgiveness even in their bodies, in their hearts, and their mind, you will now have your mercy and your grace, O oh Father. Be shed abroad in their hearts. Let your mercy will flow over them right now. And I command their bodies to be healed in Jesus' name. Whatever hindrance there are, whatever familiar spirit, whatever spirit of infirmity, whatever spirit of disease, we say the blood of Christ is against you in Jesus' name. The blood of Christ dismantle your work in Jesus' name. The blood of Christ severs Every attachment you may have, there will be video under my voice right now. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray now and I command everybody to be made whole in Jesus' name. Be healed in Jesus' name. I speak to your bodies and limbs and tissue and muscles and cell and every fiber of your being. I say be healed in the mighty name of Jesus. I say let the resurrection power of God flow through your mortal body. Let the Holy Spirit of but the fire of the Holy Ghost in Jesus quicken your mortal body and bring heaven on earth. Let the kingdom come onto your body and bring healing in Jesus' name.